Hello and welcome to the World Built Environment Forum webinar series. My name is Simon Rubinson, I'm the Chief Economist here at RICS and today we're going to be focusing on the construction sector, specifically the Q2 uh, const global construction monitor has been released overnight and we're going to look at the results of that survey which is um, really pulled together from um, an interaction with a couple of thousand RICS members around the world and once we've actually looked at the results um, I then got a really good panel that um, hope to discuss some of the issues that, that come out of that survey, but also some of the other big question marks facing the construction sector. And I do want to stress that I, I would like today to be as interactive as possible. So I would like you to, um, where possible, um, and um, if you find something particularly interesting or you want to raise a point, please use the question function and I will endeavor to get through to get through all the questions that do come in over the course of the next hour. I will of course remind you about using the, uh, the function as we go through the, um, the session. First of all, let me just introduce my panel today. I would like them to say a few words about themselves, just so you get a feel of who we have um, with us to help us navigate this, this issue. So first I have Lake Hassan. Um, Lake, can you just put your camera on and just tell the, um, the people who've dialed in um, a little bit about yourself? Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Hi, everyone. My name is Lake Hassan, and uh, I'm based here in Saudi Arabia, Riyadh. I'm working currently with uh, Mace Arabia as an associate director level, and I'm also a current chair for the RSCS KSC board. And uh, I would definitely mean, would love to share my experience and my observation in the Middle East market because I've been working in the Middle East for 23 years. I started my career in UAE and then Qatar, Oman, and the last nine years I've been working in Saudi Arabia. So thank you so much, Simon. Thank you. I look forward to hearing your thoughts, particularly as I know just how positive the feedback is from the Middle East to our latest survey. Um, the next panelist is Edna Benavides. Edna, could you um, just say a little bit about yourself, please? Hi, hello. Thank you, um, Simon. I've been working, living in, in Spain since 2004 when I started working as a quantity surveyor. I'm still based in Spain, and the last two and a half years, I've been the head of Gleed's intelligence in Europe. I'm at currently at the associate director level, and you can see my reports, my market reports on our website. They come out um, about every month. So I do a trimester study on Central Europe and Western mainland Europe. Excellent. In fact, you were, you were kind enough to forward a, a report you've just done on um, the CEE area, which was very interesting. Right. I would recommend actually having a look at the Glead sites for that. Um, Thank you. My third panellist is Shoshana Freisinger. Um, Shoshana, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, absolutely. I am based in Canada. I'm currently also sitting on the AACE Board of Directors as the past president. I'm a civil structural by education, but I've been primarily in the uh, Canadian utility sector operating uh, in EPCM project delivery and operations in project management and project controls functions. I'm currently acting as the center of excellence director for one of our nuclear clients working through Sergeant Lundy right now. Excellent. Well, welcome, Shoshana. And you've got then a bit of a perspective that sort of spans both the US and Canada. Yes, and it is. You know, focusing on some of those big, really big projects. Yeah, so and, it's, and it's very interesting to see how uh, both sides of the uh, you know, 49 parallel have very similar issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're looking forward to hearing about that. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing about <laughs> The final panelist um, um, is Justin Sullivan, an old friend of mine. So Justin, welcome. Thank you, Simon, and thank you for calling me an old friend as well. I'll take that in the best possible way possible. Uh, so good afternoon or morning or evening, everybody. Um, it's good to be doing this, Simon. So I'm, I'm a quantity surveyor, fellow of RICS, been doing this for over 30 years. Um, I specialize in quantum. So I'm a quantum expert. I do, do a lot of um, dispute work, expert witness work here in the UK and, and overseas. 
Um, I'm immediate past chair of the Construction Industry Council in the UK, which is an umbrella body for all of the professional institutions in the uh, in the built environment. I'm based in London in the UK, but I have worked in many jurisdictions, including the Middle East and the Caribbean. And I think it says it there, I'm the current senior vice president of RICS, and I'm looking forward to hear what people have to say and uh, feedback on this report. And obviously we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say as well. So um, look, thank you very much. And let's now move on with um, one of my team, Taryn Parsons, who actually is responsible for pulling the survey together, this particular survey, and indeed the commercial property survey, which was released last week. So Taryn, can you just give us a bit of a heads up on what are the key results from this particular survey? Yep, sure. Thank you, Simon. And uh, yeah, hello to everyone uh, joining us online today. Uh, of course, these survey results come at a time when the, the global economic backdrop is still challenging. There seems to be uh, plenty of reasons to be uh, cautious, at least that's the case in uh, many parts of the world. Inflation is still a big issue, and although it has eased since the start of the year, I think uh, it appears that many central banks uh, still have more to do in order to bring price growth down in line with targets. We've, of course, seen the, the Bank of England sanction another rate hike uh, earlier today. Uh, and even if interest rates may not need to rise much further from here or, or any further at all, depending on where you are, I think expectations for uh, when monetary policy may begin to loosen uh, are, generally speaking, uh, being pushed back. And just higher borrowing costs you know, create a more difficult environment for the construction industry, uh, along with you know, many other sectors of the economy, uh, for that matter. And our feedback very clearly points to a uh, tightening in credit or lending conditions uh, during the quarter. But you know, despite that, with the exception of a few markets, uh, many aspects of the survey results are uh, quite resilient in the face of these headwinds, as you'll see as I take you through uh, some of the, the kind of key findings from the, the Q2 survey round. So to start with, uh, here on the first graph is the construction activity index, which is a uh, kind of an aggregate or a summary indicator uh, that we like to produce, which incorporates several of the, the variables tracked in the survey. Uh, and this is displayed at uh, both a global level and then disaggregated by a kind of broad world region. So across the globe in aggregate, the index was more or less in line with the res uh, results from last quarter to so remaining modestly positive, which is uh, indicative of quite a steady rate of growth in construction activity. It's not especially buoyant. You can see growth appeared uh, quite a bit stronger through 2021. Uh, but the global index has regained some momentum compared to uh, late last year. And as I mentioned earlier, considering all of the challenges uh, at present across the global economy, I think a positive result is still uh, quite quite encouraging. And then looking at the breakdown of the data by world region shows the Middle East and Africa uh, displays the firmest momentum currently. That's been the case for, for a few quarters and uh, just some of the Middle Eastern markets are very solid in terms of the, the feedback we're receiving, pointing to you know, strong growth in construction activity. Also, uh, the Americas uh, and Asia Pacific returned readings that uh, are consistent with an expansion across the market, although as you can see, whereas uh, the Americas uh, appear to kind of regain some impetus this quarter uh, with the index rising. I think Asia Pacific softened slightly and we'll go more into the uh, the reasons behind that shortly but both regions are uh, nonetheless seeing an upward trend in, in construction output. And then lastly for this chart, uh, Europe continues to display uh, I'd say the most subdued results on a kind of regional comparison with the latest index reading still marginally below zero which kind of separates expansion from contraction and we would say that the current uh, return is pointing to a broadly uh, stagnant trend in construction output. So Europe has lagged other parts of the world uh, really since the second half of 2022 uh, and that remains the case in the Q2 results. Uh, so moving on to the next graph. So this one uh, depicts expectations for workloads over the coming 12 months across the three categories listed here. So private residential, private non-residential, and then infrastructure. And one message coming through very clearly is that respondents consider infrastructure to have the, the strongest outlook on this sectoral comparison uh, across all parts of the world. That's generally been the case for uh, a while now, and that there's certainly nothing in latest results to suggest this picture uh, has changed. So a very solid outlook for infrastructure in most nations uh, that we track. Now, when it comes to the, the other categories or sectors covered here, I think 12-month expectations are, are more mixed depending on which part of the world you're looking at. If we start with Europe this time, uh, although 
infrastructure returns a positive reading and therefore points to, to growth being expected over the year, come, the year to come. I think sentiment is more uh, modest or, or tempered relative to the other world regions. And then with respect to the residential sector, we'll respond it, it, at the European aggregate level, we'll anticipate you know, a flat slightly negative trend and, and to add context to this uh, workloads have already been falling reportedly falling across the residential sector over the past uh, four quarters in Europe and so these projections point to uh, little prospect of any uh, material recovery over the year ahead and I think a similar story can be told uh, when it comes to the commercial market there which obviously sits under the the private non-residential uh, heading so the outlook for both sectors at this point in time I think uh, really negatively impacted by interest rates across Europe and of course you shouldn't dismiss the, the stru structural shifts uh, that are weighing on portions of the uh, commercial real estate sphere as well but aside from Europe I would say the outlook is you know, quite resilient for the most part Middle East and Africa uh, probably has the most well-rounded kind of positive set of expectations there so solid growth envisaged across uh, each sector uh, for the Americas uh, the private residential sector it is lagging to a certain degree but it is now slightly positive and looking at some of the, the house price or sales volumes data coming from uh, the United States over recent months at times this has surprised the upside it has been generally weak but some kind of upside surprises there and I think perhaps with the interest rate cycle a little bit more advanced uh, in in the United States than in Europe there may be the expectation that some easing in monetary policy could come through a little sooner you know, sometime next year and that would support uh, housing markets there and I think the narrative most likely also applies to private uh, commercial as well uh, which saw an, an improvement in expectations during Q2 and then for Asia Pacific who comfortably positive projections across the board although as we'll see on this next slide uh, the, the picture is incredibly mixed in different parts of the region so if we move on to this next graph this shows the the country level data for the uh, construction activity index uh, and just to demonstrate the kind of divergence across asia pacific you can see markets like india uh, philippines singapore uh, all returning some uh, some very i would say upbeat feedback in the q2 survey and then move over to the, to the right hand side there you'll see china which had actually experienced a boost in sentiment following uh, the removal of, of covid restrictions earlier in the year and that seems to have proven you know, quite short-lived so a lot of negativity uh, re-emerging of late uh, i think that appears to be quite in keeping with the economic growth figures coming out of china they have fallen short of expectations and it looks like the, the government is turning to uh, stimulus measures now to, to support the economy so, so that's part of the story there and then elsewhere across apac uh, you have markets such as new zealand and australia uh, where the results sit somewhere in between those stronger and weaker performing uh, areas so as i say probably the most mixed region in terms of the individual country results but meanwhile uh, for Europe I think the results are very consistent at the country level you've got the UK Germany France Spain Italy the Netherlands all of these uh, have returned to flat to, to modestly negative reading for the headline index in Q2 and I think uh, in a lot of cases across the continent you, you're getting you know, continued growth in infrastructure uh, being offset by that really challenging backdrop for, for residential uh, and that's a very common theme in Europe but by way of contrast, up at the stronger end of the scale, you can see Saudi Arabia uh, and the UAE, both nations continuing to deliver uh, some really strong construction output, uh, output growth, according to our respondents. So that's, as I said, been the case for the past several quarters, and it's still uh, very much visible in Q2. Also, one final point worth mentioning uh, on this kind of country level breakdown is that both the, the United States and Canada saw, uh, I would say, quite the noticeable uh, pick up in sentiment during Q2 uh, and now show some, some pretty solid results so a strengthening in momentum across uh, North America is evident in our uh, latest feedback so if we move uh, move on now to look at the factors that uh, are reportedly hindering the market I think you know, it's a little surprise that once again material costs are uh, the most uh, widely referenced obstacle thought to be uh, holding back construction activity um, so at the global level displayed here it's around 70% of uh, respondents that take that view um, however you know, although it still clearly remains a significant issue I think the share of contributors reporting this has now moderated uh, slightly in each of the last five quarters so back in the, the first quarter of 2022 we had 91 percent 
of survey participants across the globe, citing a you know, material cost uh, as an impediment to construction activity. So at least the picture does seem to be turning slowly, quite consistently, even if it is still a critical issue. And then alongside this, you can see that material shortages uh, are now quite far down on this list. So 46% of respondents report issues with uh, the availability of materials, and that has eased from around uh, three quarters of contributors uh, just over a year ago. So bottlenecks have clearly loosened uh, in that regard to, to some extent, uh, and it's now financial constraints that are, are more heavily referenced as causing uh, difficulties. Well, skill shortages and general labour shortages remain uh, prevalent with you know, around two thirds of our survey participants drawing attention to uh, these kind of shortfalls in their local markets. Uh, just moving on. So then this idea all ties together when looking at uh, uh, projections for uh, the year ahead and some of the different components to go into this. Again, uh, this here is all at the, the global level. Uh, and so projections for, for growth in total construction costs have uh, they've softened slightly in each of the last three reports now, although the current forecasts uh, from respondents, they're, they're still considerably higher uh, than where they were, say, at the start of 2020, but they have uh, moderated of late. And that really seems to have been driven by expectations of easing material cost inflation, which has followed a very similar pattern. So pressures around material costs, uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, they do appear to be letting up slowly, even though they remain uh, a significant challenge. But skill shortages remain as evident uh, as any other point you know, over recent years or on this worldwide view at least. And as you can see, projections for growth in skilled labour costs have not seen any uh, meaningful reduction over this time frame. And perhaps we're now seeing a shift uh, away from material inflation being uh, the main cause for concern and, and towards kind of skill shortage issues uh, as facing greater pressure in terms of you know, the, the associated rise in costs. So it is interesting to see uh, the dynamic changing in later results. And perhaps we will uh, continue to, to see this shift, just creating slightly different pressure points going forward. But uh, those are the obstacles. But overall, you know, despite some you know, fairly hefty challenges to grapple with, uh, all things considered, I think the construction industry is showing uh, a lot of resilience right now, uh, for the most part anyway, uh, according to these results. So growth is being cited in a lot of nations uh, across the world, and infrastructure remains uh, a key driver of this. So that's my summary of the, the Q2 findings. Uh, back to you, Simon. Thank you, Taran, for that. And, um, you know, quite an interesting summary. I mean, I know that, you know, this resilience and um, the talk of recession is something that, you know, more generally is something that's been um, ongoing for quite a while. And I think one of our panellists this morning talked about us economists trying to uh, talk the uh, uh, the, the economy, the global economy, and and the construction sector into recession. Um, I did sort of obviously push back a little on that, but clearly though it is interesting that when you look at a lot of the industry trends and certainly the feedback we're getting here, that there does appear to be quite a lot of resilience, and it's not just in those markets which are not being impacted by um, higher interest rates. But anyway, let me call the panel back, please, um, because I would really like to get your thoughts, first of all, on what Tarrant had to say. And I think, look, you know, the, the, the results there are particularly solid, particularly impressive, I should say, from the Middle East. And I, so I, I thought perhaps, you know, we ought to start with where we're getting the most positive feedback and just try and understand whether that's what you're seeing on the ground, Lee. I mean, is that, is it really all that positive? Thank you, Simon. And thank you, Taran. I mean, you very well explained and you, the points you have raised, that's the real reality, I would say. Um, see, I mean, of course, as everyone knows that the construction boom in the Middle East has been going on for the last two decades, more than two decades. But at the moment, of course, the more uh, the construction booming market is in Saudi Arabia. And as I just few name it, you all know that the Neom project and the Red Sea project, these are the big landmark and the Kiga projects at the moment going on in the region. So of course they generate the more, I mean, the, the vision of the, of course, the, the ruler basically to basically launch a more projects. And when the more giga project launch and within the region, of course, and all across the Saudi Arabia, as I just name it few, and of course, within the city, outside the city. So when this giga project started, of course, the challenges start simultaneously. The challenges, what usually, you know, the two 
main factor which influence in the any construction this is microeconomics factor and industrial uh, industrial specific uh, challenges so microeconomics factor of course i would not say there is any big challenges are here like for example economic growth or interest rate or governmental policy because government are promoting all those projects yes when i talk about i mean if, if i just touch that the second part of industry specific challenges which very well darren has highlighted labor shortage and the cost uh, fluctuation that's a big challenge at the moment and of course the, the other parts as well so if i talk if i'll share with you the labor market because the, they're a huge because of the huge project number of the project and different packages within the giga projects there's a peak demand of the skill labor which is still shortage and most of the contractors and even the consultant engineers they are struggling to hire and bring more people in the region uh, in the country to work and you know support them because i mean you can you can bring the company but you need a labor force to work exactly on, actually in the ground so without the labor, without the resources, you cannot deliver. So that's a big challenge at the moment, which I feel and I observe that most of the contractors and the client developer they are facing. And the second challenge I would say is the cost because of simultaneously all these projects been started at the same time, I mean, more or less, and uh, all over across the KSA and the same time, there was some project, of course, in the, K, in, in the UAE as well, and the Qatar. Of course, Qatar is a bit of a slowdown after the World Cup, our still some project need to be complete, which is still in the pipeline. So yeah, that's because of these mega, mega giga projects and all the projects starting simultaneously. The material price is going high, and that of course affect very heavily on the project uh, budgets and the, and the tentative costs. Okay, well, look, thank you for that. And I'm sure we're going to come back to some of those issues over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. I think I'm then going to go to the other side of the coin. So I don't know, Edna, you know, the feedback, look, the feedback isn't wholly negative, but it's pretty flat. I mean, is that something that you would you would recognize? Well, so your report um, summarizes all of Europe into one, right? So we do have some countries that are doing better, and then we have some countries that are really struggling. Um, the ones closest to Ukraine have been hit really hard in the construction industry. Um, the inflation has been huge. Hungary, I have the, the report that was published yesterday, I have it right in front of me. So Hungary, I think they're still, let's see, their inflation is still, it was 20% in June. Um, they're very slow to recover the, the countries in the East. Um, their proximity to the war has just taken such a toll on them. But then you have countries in the West that do have, um, they've been able to make use of their EU recovery and resilience funds. They've been able to put things into play. There are things already into action. Um, these are funds, if you aren't aware to the wider audience, it, it was our pandemic recovery mechanism. Um, and those funds expire in 2026. So a percentage of those funds are loans and a percentage of those funds are grants. Um, and every country has to propose a plan. The, obviously the plans are heavily, uh, they invest heavily in infrastructure type projects and other projects that will require some private investment or will result in private investment. So there's a lot of 5G networks going on. Italy has a, has, has allotted a majority, well, maybe not a majority, but they've allotted a significant amount of their funds to a 5G network for the entire country to serve um, areas that had been forgotten throughout the country. And that will require data centers, right? So, so we do have a lot of work in the next two or three years, which I think is reflected in your report that the European countries have an expectation for the next few years to have a lot of investment in infrastructure. What I'm getting at is that that infrastructure will result in private investments that can piggyback, right? So, so again, the 5G networks, all of this 5G investment across all of the European countries, because it was one of their um, one of their scorecard requirements was to digitize their countries to bring their countries up to speed. Um, that requires data centers. We're having such a boom in data centers that some countries have capped the energy available to power data centers, and they cannot build any more data centers, even though they have a demand for it. Um, data centers are also, they're creating such a demand on skilled labor, which is also in your report, that there's a skilled labor shortage, isn't there? So there are, are a lot of things in your report that, that um, did not surprise me. I think something that, that investors cannot lose sight of is that while some sectors are hurting, as is the residential sector, because interest rates on loans are, are um, people cannot take on those levels, right? So while private residential is suffering greatly, other sectors are 
growing to an extent, right? In Spain, we have a, a large uh, hotel industry and many hotels have chosen to use this downtime of the pandemic, the downtime to go ahead and invest in, in design refurbishment. And now those refur refurbishment projects are coming to fruition as far as construction has started, right? So there are some sectors that are still keeping the industry afloat and we are experiencing that shortage of skilled engineers and consultants and quantity surveyors because the projects that are pushing ahead are so big that they're consuming the, the, the manpower available, right? And just on that date, you said some countries have put a limit on data centers. Who, who's done that, for example? I, I mean, that's interesting. Well, well, it's because of power. They're, they don't have any more power yeah, no, to get. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Germany, my understanding is that Germany has reached their limit as far as power, so that the power will not be available for a few more years. Um, I believe the Netherlands or Denmark has also reached that limit. So there's a few okay. countries that they've maxed out their power availability. Thank and you. until they get that up to speed, they can't commit to yeah. more data centers. Now that's interesting. And certainly the feedback, I think, Tarrant, from our survey is pretty much everywhere that data, anything to do with data is pretty popular, you know. Yeah. the expectations are pretty strong linked to it and while we're just as we sort of just round off on europe and then i'm going to come to north america but as we round off justin i mean you know what are you seeing and for the from a more uk sort of centric point of view yeah thanks simon and um great report and i would echo what edna said as well that it does reflect actually the sentiment that i'm seeing in, in the market so talking about the uk i think I think one word really sums up the UK at the moment, and that is uncertainty. So we've got um, the same problems with interest rates that have been suffered elsewhere. That's causing funding to be challenging, and there's less funding available. There's been a real gestation period for projects getting going. Um, and we've been suffering from that since Brexit. Yeah, and then since then we've had COVID. So it takes a lot longer to get a deal over the line. And in the meantime, our market is changing as well, particularly in residential. So house prices aren't as high, they're coming down. Um, there's a shortage of rental properties and we're seeing landlords leaving the market because you get more money, for, more buck for your dollar or your pound if you stick it in the stock market than if you do into property. So, which is interesting, which is, which is leading to viability of projects um, being, being different. We've also got the challenge of inflation. So interest rates went up today again in the UK. Um, is it the top? I don't know, we're at five and a quarter now. Um, a lot of pundits are saying the last rise was the last rise. Yeah, there's another one. Um, they're putting up the rates to try and bring inflation down in the UK. Inflation's running, Simon, at about 7%, 7.5% at the moment. Yeah. Um, the government's target is 2%. So we're still quite a long way away from that. What's um, driving the market is infrastructure, and that was reflected in your in your report, um, Tarrant and Simon. It's it's showing that that is happening. Um, the news hasn't been so great on HS2. It's a massive project. There was an article in the Telegraph, um, which is quite uncomplimentary about that, and social media is going crazy about how a project that that big can be in such um, trouble as it as it seems. It is um, ha housing. We've got uncertainty there as well in the UK. We've got the Building Safety Act, um, which is coming into play. First of October, they opened the registration for the new regulator. There's uncertainty, uncertainty over high-risk buildings, that's buildings over 18 metres and some over 11 on how many staircases, is it one or two staircases? So the developers, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not going forwards with them. They're not putting them into planning. They're not spending money on consultants at this stage until that um, uncertainty is resolved and really i'm not sure when that is the first of april the new approved inspectors will be in place we had a meeting this week with government on that and the general feeling in the room from the leaders they, they the leaders from the the built environment building control it was uncertainty it was the same the same word so, um but there's always a silver lining to times like this and that is that disputes are higher so when we go into challenging times, Simon's laughing, it's great for us expert witnesses. It takes two years to get a case into court in the UK at the moment. Um, adjudications are busy, expert witnesses are busy. And I, I challenge RICS every time, Simon, don't I? Put a stat up there 
on referrals to adjudication and arbitration and expert work because I think it's really busy. My business, we're very busy. We're hiring. Um, it's good times for us because there are a lot of disputes out there. I'm very, I'm very glad for you, Justin, and I'm sure many people who are, who are dialing into this um, webinar are equally pleased that you're 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 thriving in challenging times. Um, Shoshana, I mean, you 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 work on some of these big projects in North America. What's going on there? And I've, have you got the same sort of issues that we've been hearing about? You know what? I'm kind of taking a bit of a sense of comfort to know that we're not alone dealing with all of these issues across the pond. Um, you know, we it's it's no surprise that you know the North American governments have both implemented you know infrastructure initiatives with you know green and tech spending um, you know uh, opportunities being the key focus area for them. Uh, so we see that, you know, as vendors, there's a bit of a, a buyer's, a seller's market here in that there are so many projects to choose from. However, um, you have the same limitations, again, of, you know, the financial concerns, you know, all of the projects that are currently in play, you know, they had their estimates and their, and their forecasts and their budget set um, in the business plan many moons ago. And now we're having to revisit them and, and you know, revisit our productivity factors so that we can adjust our forecasts accordingly to what we're seeing in the market. Yes, you know, we're starting to see um, uh, uh, materials coming in a little bit better, but the supply chain is still in flux. So the materials are costing more and we're not necessarily getting them when we expected those costs to hit our business plan. So again, we have to look at that and um, as, as we're in, uh, you know, a number of uh, PPP type contract arrangements, having those conversations with, you know, our government partners becomes a, a bit of a challenge because, of course, they are also financially constrained with what they've they've got available to us. We also saw after the pandemic that, you know, resources, um, again, echoing very scarce, um, you know, everybody wanted to move out of the city into a rural area and, you know, become a TikTok influencer. And so rather than, you know, a, you know, a cost estimate or a quantity surveyor. And so there's a real challenge to find not just trades, uh, but, you know, engineers, project managers, project controls, um, resources and and when you do find them um, ensuring that they actually have the right skill and qualification is a bit of a problem so you know here in the nuclear industry we are um, you know again just uh, just as Justin is uh, in a boom situation because because of claims the nuclear industry has a huge renaissance right now and so there are a number of mega projects that are on the books for the owners which is great however um, you know, finding this, you know, the materials, finding the people um, is, is a challenge. And so you see two of the um, major nuclear operators in Ontario have actually developed what I'm going to call resource pipeline programs. So, uh, you know, it, down south with Ontario Power Generation, they've got a, a trades program. So directly through the owner um, and here in uh, in Bruce County, which is very rural, um, we are working with our local, uh, you know, higher education institutions to develop that pipeline program and develop those um, micro credentials chilling program so that we can upskill our current resources and develop that pipeline that might be local to the area for you know the 20 or 40 year programs that we see coming um, but I, I think we may actually also be a little bit late in that um, to Edna's point regarding you know data centers and and availability of, of you know energy we also see a lot more requests for small modular reactors for um, what I would call non um, grid production type usage and and so it trying to understand how that works from a, a regulatory and and commercial point of view uh, is is also you know something that we're kind of working through up here in North America and then of course 
every owner has uh, you know a very limited funds that they have to work with they're concerned about inflation and managing all of you know the challenges that we have against our original business planning assumptions so they're asking vendors to be innovative and so a lot of uh, a lot of vendors are looking towards AI and how they can incorporate this without uh, um, in influencing or impacting you know cybersecurity risks so there are there are real uh, there are you know, real potential opportunities for uh, cost savings, but understanding the risk profile around that, I think we're still working through that. And in AACE, we're talking a lot about how we can develop those, you know, industry best practices and guidelines to help, you know, drive the industry just as Rix is. So it's, uh, it's, it's good news for us too as associations. <laughs> Excellent. Um, look, I just want to remind everyone who's dialing in on this and listening in, please do um, put through your questions or any comments that you have in that question section. Just type them in and we'll try and get to some. But I mean, I'm just in, I'm interested in this whole idea of skills because, you know, my background isn't, isn't real estate or construction. And I, I came to RICS um, relatively late, I was working financial services, and I don't recall the skills issue. I mean, there's always a demand for skills, but I don't remember it being the the constant refrain, "Come good or bad." You know, we've got buoyant markets like in the Middle East, and that they their skill shortages there. We've got sort of markets that are perhaps a little bit flatter in Europe. There's still skill shortages, and you know, North America. You've talked, you've mentioned the same sort of thing, and I'm just wondering, you know what is the best practice how are we going to address this you know we can't i i mean leek i know that there's been some issues across the middle east about you know the the and i've got to be careful what i say here but about the, the sheer demand for projects in saudi arabia sort of almost sort of great you know, dragging you know labor away from other markets and i know i find it fascinating but also i wonder what, what is the long-term way in which we deal with this how do we get more people in the sector and you know really um skill, you know tooled up skilled up to do to to deal with the very real issue jobs that you know you know and probably quite sustainable jobs that we have here i mean lake i mean what are you seeing how's how saudi arabia responding to this yes uh thank you Salman. um someone i would say that as shushana also said that they have a shortage of like project managers not only just the skilled laborers as a carpenter, masons, and other uh, trade uh, uh, professionals, we have a real professional shortage as well. The project managers and the quantity surveyors and estimator and all. Here, the basic, I would say that the main role of RSCS basically starts here. What we are what doing here in the region, specifically in the Middle East, and or myself as a, as a chair in the, in the case, said that we are trying to basically promote more in the RCS. We are basically convincing the different developer, different clients, and we are providing the trainings, in-house trainings to them. And we said, okay, if you if you hiring a great fresh graduate from the local market, which is the local nationals, so we basically provide them a trainings in terms of RICS accredited trainings and also a different membership routes because in we have different you know more than 22 pathways which covers not only just the quantity surveying or property valuation, because the property valuation is a big market here as well in the, in the Saudi Arabia itself. And of course, uh, across the Middle East in UAE and Qatar. So the real estate uh, professional, we are basically trying to provide them a training. We are trying, we are guiding them how you can achieve the professional membership, whether it's a SOAP membership or MRICS, and how, I mean, what are the, uh, the competencies you have to cover in, uh, while you, when you achieve your membership. So that's how we are providing the trainings for the local uh, professionals. We are providing trainings to the different companies, the leading developers, the leading clients, in-house trainings. So that's the one part we are trying to cover to basically develop the skills of our professionals. And as well as the other definitely sectors are there who are basically providing a training for, uh, like most of the, you know, the labor force comes from the South Asian countries. So I heard that they have also started some kind of a training to train them their trademen. Uh, so then when they go to the uh, Middle East market, so they will be well trained, not only just in their own country perspective, they know how to meet the, the standards and the technicality which is going on. Because every construction market, like the construction is construction, but the construction or the material which is being used in North America is different than the Middle East because of the weather condition. 
So if we bring anyone from the South Asian countries, any workforce, of course, they must be trained or have experience in that particular country. So there are some companies, there are some associations, there are some institutions who are basically giving, providing a training to those tradesmen. So that's how we are trying to cover. And of course, other than that, we are providing the training like a CBT session frequently across the country, across the Middle East. Okay. Well, look. I mean, I, I mean, clearly, I mean, I, I mean, that's you know, all, all this sort of training and really the RICS and the AACE getting involved in all of this is clearly helpful. But is it? I mean, do people feel it's moving the needle? Are we getting more people attracted to the sector? I mean, is that really happening? Because I say, I mean, I don't know what I know. I've known Justin for a few years, and I know this issue always comes up when we talk. Um, and it just feels that you know. Well, come rain or shine, the one thing you can rely on is a skill shortage in the construction sector. And you're right, Leek, it's not just the trades. The trades are certainly there, but you know, our feedback also talks about, you know, I mean, I white collar type roles as well. So you know, is there a best practice? Is there anyone out there, you know, is there a country that's doing it well? Has someone got the right schemes in place? Anyone know? Yes. Well, the, the EU Recovery and Resilience Plan, one of the requirements was um, sustainability as far as people having access to jobs, right? So two countries that stand out in my mind, I, I read a lot of the country's proposals, those proposals were scored and then the EU rejected them or requested requested provisions and then until they, they approved a final proposal. So in the early days, France and Germany both um, foresaw the need for skilled labor because of all of the construction that they were proposing in their plans they saw a need to have people to actually build the project so they did make an investment at the government level to upskill and uh bring new people into the trades at least in the trades right germany was making an investment in um modernizing the skills in their timber industry because timber is very important in germany so some countries it they are addressing it as far as the the blue collar side of it, the skilled tra the trades. They're upskilling existing laborers and and bringing new people into it. As far as engineers and architects, it is an ongoing challenge, isn't it? And it I have read about it in other reports where as population um, decreases in the next is it a twenty year projection or a forty year projection that robotics needs to take over, right? Because we won't have laborers to lay bricks or to do this or to do that. Our industry faces, we have a lot of fear right now with AI that is it going to get rid of the quantity surveyor? It, will AI put us all out of work? And I don't think it will because we're just, we're so shorthanded. We need some degree of computers to help us in our project controls and our reporting because it's difficult to keep up with the pace of what's going on right now. Um, and, and then as far as outreach and making our industry attractive to new and young people that are choosing degrees, well, that that falls on all of us a little bit, I suppose. <laughs> to my children, I'm sorry, they they have not signed up for anything related to construction. They're going in different paths. I did what I could, but maybe they're friends. <laughs> maybe yeah. I convinced a friend of theirs. I mean, you know, someone someone has actually sent. Uh, we got a few questions that have come in around this particular issue, and one person's talked about, you know, pay. Is the pay? I mean, that's always a thorny issue, and the answer is obviously yes. It's too low. We all say that. But um, you know, I'm just I don't know how do you create an environment in which more people choose this particular profession, which in many respects, and I say someone who's not been part of it historically, but when you look at the you know, what you're generating and the excitement around what you're generating, you know, I think it stands up pretty well against most other professions, but it's still hard. It's still a hard sell. So I don't know. I mean, it's how you actually move the needle there. Simon, Simon, I, I do have a view on this, particularly where there's a skill shortage for unskilled and skilled labour, which is, as you say, is a perennial problem. I, I, I think we treat our, treat our workers really badly. OK, I think the well-being and the mental health in construction is appalling. And I think for people like us, we're leaders, we're white collar. We have a responsibility to make that better. And it's something that I've been really, really started to push for as I stepped down from the the, the CIC. In the UK, suicide is, is the highest in construction. It's two people a day, okay? And it's not the quantity surveyors, 
it's 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 the site laborers and the carpenters it's people like that it's their working conditions it's the food that they eat okay it's the food that we give them the nutrition in the canteens the developers i think it should be a, a code it should be mandated that we have to treat these people better because we're not paying them fantastic amounts and we saw in covid we saw them leaving construction yeah then that wasn't just in the uk a lot in the uk with a problem with um, lorry drivers, wagon drivers leaving and going into the um, retail retail space. Same thing happened in America. And when they leave, they don't come back. Yeah. So because we treat them badly, a lot of them are self-employed, um, and if there's no work, we don't pay them. Yeah, that's, that's it. Tough. You're a subcontractor. Um, we don't pay them. So I think we can do that better, Simon. I think in the, the the professional sector it's different okay what we're seeing is apprentices okay and i have an apprentice program in my business and they're great so they're they're doing university it's going to take them i think five years but they're getting paid to do that we're paying for their education when they leave they've got no debt yeah they've not got an accommodation debt and a, a, a degree university debt and that that is working and that is being promoted by government and they're not expensive I mean, the, the the amount we pay the universities is so low because it is, it is subsidized um, by, by government. But the, the other thing I'd say, what we're seeing is we're actually seeing more good people around. So CVs are floating around, which are really good. We've not seen that for a while. So that says to me, the market is moving um, and we're seeing wages go up in the professional sector as well. So I know that, that in Saudi, you're having to do that, but that is having a trickle effect across into the into the uk um yeah we can do it we can do this better we can really do this better I'm I wonder how much of this, sorry simon I, I was gonna say i wonder how much of this is left over from the financial crisis and people didn't want to go into construction because there was no construction and we have yeah. a gap there in my office we have chunks of people as far as ages right we have people are grouped by age and there is a gap there of a few years where i think no one wanted to do construction architecture anything in the engineering because there was no there was no forecasted job opportunities right in the short term for people that are 17 18 years old trying to choose what they're going to study at the university level it was very unattractive those years and we're suffering that now i think so that yeah. every every business i talk to that middle level edna we're we're lacking in my business but you talk to recruiters is that everybody is looking for that level yeah it's a good point yeah and and i would just to add to both of those perspectives here in North America, you know, for the longest time, and I would I would argue it still sort of exists. There's this perception that you know trades work is a dirty word, that it's somehow lesser than um, you know the desk job, and and that's completely untrue. Um, and and oftentimes, you know, that tradesperson makes more than we do as as the project management. Um, and then when you when you look at the you know you said you said we don't treat our trade people very well but I would also argue that we sometimes don't treat our, our project people very well either particularly when we have a, a niche environment like nuclear where the skills are um, it, there are some additional skills that are required you find that good person and you end up overworking them um, because you haven't found anybody else and then and and to the point of breaking right where where they don't have that work-life balance that they need and then go elsewhere because again they want to find that work-life balance and uh, you lose them forever they won't come back and so you know the, the none of us never none of us really come into project management from you know high school decision making right and we nobody even told us that this was an option right we somehow get into a field and and slowly people see we have uh, some sort of aptitude and put us on a path that we don't really know because it's not really defined or written down and i think you know as uh, as professionals as association um uh, leaders you know not just in associations, but in our corporate life. I think we need to do better, um, a better job, as you say, Edna, in promoting um, these professions and, and clearly identifying that career path and what they can achieve and, and get out of it, the value of it. Because right now, I don't know that, that they, 
they necessarily see it. And if you if you're working in a job and you don't know what your next step is along your career path, um, you you may not want to stay on that path. You may want to move somewhere else that seems maybe a little bit more uh, comfortable. And uh, you know we also have the issue of a lot of what we can do can be done remotely. And so you have this hybrid workforce um, that uh, looks attractive and, and can be functional, but is it is it really giving us the best work product from a planning perspective uh, or an execution perspective? Because you know the the boots on the ground view for the quantity surveyor, the estimator, uh, to to come up with you know the business planning assumptions, uh, you can only get so much reading the engineering drawings, right? And and so there's there's that there's that little bit that mentoring that um you know that. Uh, learning by osmosis that happens when you are situated with with uh, mentors and and those who sit above you to help uh, you know shape and, and and inform your your learning as you're growing in your career path. I think that that's also a little broken right now. Um, and certainly just getting out to high schools and saying, hey, you know what? This is this is a cool career. You know, there's there's some sexiness to it. You can play with computers. Like whatever it is, we we can do to sell it. Um, at that lower level, I think it would be good because you're right, Edna. My my daughter wanted nothing to do with projects. <laughs> just get, Shoshana, just I'm um, going back then to another point that Edna made. I mean, to what extent? I mean, we could broaden that out. I mean, AI, off-site construction. To what extent can we sort of bypass the, the you know the skills issue? I'd say I'm talking to someone who isn't involved directly in construction, so perhaps I'm being naive. But to what extent can we bypass? And as economists, the root, the stuff that I do understand is when someone like McKinsey produces a report saying the construction sector is performing lamentably when it comes to productivity when you compare it to virtually any other industry. So, I mean, one, is that true in your opinion? And secondly, and I would like to get other other views on this as well in a minute. Secondly, can we enhance productivity and deal with the skill shortage by going more for, you know, beginning to think about AI a bit more and off-site construction type techniques? Yeah, I think it's not just AI, just to jump in before Edna comes in, you know, with, with BIM, modeling in place right uh, that that also can help and you know that younger generation is you know that much more savvy when it comes to using computers i think we don't if, if we if we you know provided that perspective uh and and help them understand that you know they have skills um that they can apply that that's something i think we can work on too sorry okay. Edna. No, any thoughts? Oh, that's fine. So, so computers and and quantity surveying, it helps us. I think right now I'm on I'm on a very big project right now that we have about 12 people on the project, and we're obviously using computers. But the turnaround is so quick that it's difficult for us to keep up. We do we do need to use some some more advanced technology. Um, to keep up with the reporting required on the project. Um, whereas before, maybe you could walk through a project and, and write down a snagging list. We really do need a camera on our helmets to take pictures and just log it that way as quickly as possible. Um, as far as AI in our industry, everything needs to be interpreted by an expert, right? The reliability of if I go to whatever program I decide to use and I say, how much is a hotel in Madrid? What's the probability of that being the most accurate information, taking into account things that I know as a professional in the area, that I things that I know that are coming, things that are forecasted, things that maybe the politics are going to change next week. AI doesn't know that or they haven't taken that into account. So, so yes, technology it can help us with production, but we always do need to be involved. So another thing that holds us back, I think, is, is the investment. Some of these things have big ticket items, you know, are big ticket items. It's quite an investment. And sometimes if your company doesn't want to make the investment, you take it to the client, but they don't want to make the investment either. Um, so all of these things are great. And, and the, the, the marketing videos are make everything look so easy and exciting and perfect. But the ticket price is usually a, a deterrent, isn't it? So we're back to having people doing these these fulfilling the task that maybe could be quicker uh, in another way 
Yeah, and Thanks. Justin Lake, I mean, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, well, I mean, see, I'll uh, just make the two points. One is that, that as uh, both of my fellows said, that the lack of interest from our new generation in towards the code and construction side as or select the, the professional like a project manager or the estimation or quantity surveying. Here, what we, I was just want to share that what we are doing here in the region that is still, you know, the engineering degree of a civil or mechanical or electrical still exist. And they, I mean, they are, have a mass production of course in the students every year. So what we adopt that strategy is that we are approaching those universities. We are giving a small presentation to the kids in the universities or colleges, as I say, once you complete your civil engineering or mechanical or electrical, you have a different way to go out, okay? You have a different pathway. So what is the attraction if you join the construction industry to and become a project manager or a, or a chartered quantity surveyor or a facility manager? So then what are the, I mean, the, the career growth in that? And of course, not in just the career, in, along with the career is a big, good salaries, handsome salaries are there. So that's how we are promoting, we are basically guiding them that these are also a good pathway for you to select and think about it. And I'm very positive, very optimistic. I'm, I'm taking the glass half full that there are many, I mean, so we're getting a very positive uh, reaction or, you know, I mean, response from the students. That's the one thing. And secondly, about the AI, again, it's very that everything has an advantage and disadvantage. I personally feel is, is that that our own creativity is basically blocking our own creativity because as I say that if you, drop a question and then AI will provide you some data. How a data is authentic to, to basically to cross check, to verify, you have to work. You have to again go and search. The time amount of time you will spend to verify the data which provided by the AI is better you do your own work. And based on your own experience or maybe you know you are in-house where working in any organization, everyone has their in-house data. So again, AI is good, but at some extent. Well, actually, yeah, we just had a comment from one of the one of the people listening in saying AI might be good for site surveys and pre-building components of site, but I, I think it is essential to keep the human side involved for quality control and stand back and look and check at things. So perhaps reinforcing some of the messaging. Look, I mean, I've got probably one more question because we're running out of time. But I mean, you know, perhaps we'll start with the Middle East. But you know, the whole push for sustainability in the sector, in a way, that's a way to attract young people, as people have said. You know, digitalization and sustainability, two quite attractive themes for young people. But specifically on sustainability, you know, obviously some mega projects there, which you know are sort of, are going to sort of conform to very high standards when it comes to sustainability. Are we getting? Are we moving with the component parts? Are we getting the the the, both the operational and the embodied carbon issues addressed. I mean, what do you think, Lake? Yes, I mean, this is one of the hot topic, of course, all over the world. And uh, if I talk, I mean, I give a reference here within the Saudi and Middle East, of course. So the, given the Saudi, we have a sustainability goal for 2020, where because we are working on the more climate side. So even like if I give you an example of my current project, we have basically recently adopted lots of um, strategy and procedure for the sustainability. And uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is it's, it's a bit of a long debate, a long topic. So I would say, yes, we are working on, and of course, with the carbon zero, I mean, the government policies are very strict. You know, they are very, very serious about the sustainability. Okay, thank you. And Justin, I mean, obviously, RICS is trying to do quite a lot around sort of standards in this area as well. I mean, what's your perception of how we're moving along the, the, the continuum? So we, we actually had some ICMS calls today, Simon. The, International Construction Management um, Coalition. So um, the classic is if you if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So um, what we're looking at is um, measuring carbon. So we've got, now got a standard for, for how it's presented, but the measurement of carbon is being done differently all over the world. There is not a global standard for that. So we're looking looking at that. You can then start benchmarking properly, and you can then start comparing and naming and shaming so it's very difficult time people talk about it but not a lot of it happens the driver is always commerce is always making money on the project unless it's legislated and mandated which is not going to happen in the uk you get a 20 percent saving if you do new builds if you knock it down and rebuild it you don't pay back we're actually encouraging people to demolish stuff 
and then build new stuff, which is increase, increasing the carbon footprint. It's, it's, it's a tough one. I think unless you legislate, our sector is not going to not going to change. Oh, well, that's a shame. I, I noticed, I mean, I saw a figure, Edna, and we're really running out of time, but I did see a figure today. I don't know, if, well, I saw, I'm sure, it, perhaps it's right, perhaps it's not, that renovation in Europe accounts for half of all construction work. Is that right? Or am I making I, that up? I don't know. I will not argue it. How's that? I'll <laughs> let you have that figure. Um, <laughs> As far as sustainability, I think our biggest driver in the EU is is banks. They require they require that you meet some standards as far as sustainability and carbon footprint for them to finance your project. And that's really that has been the driving force behind and behind developers wanting to take on sustainability issues in their construction projects. Okay, thank you. And final word to Shoshana then. Yeah, uh, you know, the conversation here in North America is knowing that you have to have, uh, you know, the carbon, the carbon cost, um, you know, uh, uh, factored into contracts, um, you know, uh, what, what will that do? Because as Justin says, if you can't measure it, you can't quant, you know, you can't, you can't put it down as a claim if you can't measure it. And I can see that, you know, at, as it stands right now, um, you know, the requests to make it carbon neutral, um, you know, and, and trying to define that within contract language might be a, a very tricky place to live uh, until we get some, you know, standards and guidelines out there in the community for, you know, benchmarking against. So it sounds like there's a lot of work there for um, RICS, AACE and various other organisations to sort of uh, be sort of really committed to, to try and get us to the place where we want to be. Um, look, uh, thank you so much for um, contributing today. Um, the panelists, Shoshana, Edna, Justin and Leek, you know, really made a, a great conversation and I'm sure we could have continued for another hour. People often say that, but I think, you know, you say that and, um, you know, we didn't get to all the questions that came in, but thank you for putting, submitting them, those who did, and I'm sure there'll be a request for the panellists to come back to you um, in written form. But thank you everyone for that. Um, and I just really want to wrap up now um, with a few final remarks, um, just so you're aware that there will be um, a recording and a written summary of this event. So if you weren't able to stick with it, you will be able to um, find a recording to listen to the whole of it. And indeed, if you weren't able, in which case you won't listen to me now, you'll still be able to uh, um, find a recording and listen to the conversation. Um, so. So that um, hopefully will um, uh, enable you to sort of keep pace with um, the conversation here. Alongside that, you know, we've got a number of other events. There's always webinars going on on the web on the WebF platform, but you can see that just here a list of some of the bigger um, events coming up, including a conference in London and perhaps I'd say a more attractive conference in Venice. Actually, I think that's the one I'm going to. Um, but um, yes, yeah, a number of events, you can find all this on the WebF website. Um, the Global Construction Monitor, which Karen talked about so, so uh, eloquently, that is now on the website. You can scan it here, but you'll have to be quick because we're going to be moving on from this page. But it is on the RICS website on news and insights and then market surveys and global construction. Do have a look at the report. And more importantly, next time, please contribute to the report. Um, and then finally, you can always follow um, the WebF um, event list um, through the usual social media um, um, opportunities. Where I, th I think actually our Twitter um, um, emblem there is out of date, but uh, just looking at it, since I see on my phone, it's changed shape. Um, yes. but, um, you can see where you can uh, find out more about what we're doing. So look, a big thank you to everyone who dialed in and a big thank you to my panellists. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Hi, everyone.